Joining me, Jack Berkman, Republican strategist and host of Behind the Curtain with Jack Berkman. Catch him every Saturday night on the Radio America Network and Sunday afternoons at 2 on WMAL in Metro D.C. Also, Mark Levine, nationally syndicated radio talk show host and the Democratic nominee for the 45th District in the Virginia House of Delegates. This week, several 2016 presidential hopefuls touched on the subject of race in America at the National Urban League Forum in Florida. I have no desire to get rid of safety nets for people who need them. I have a strong desire, however, to provide a ladder to get people out of dependency so that they become part of the fabric of America. And the racial disparities you work hard every day to overcome go against everything I believe in and everything I want to help America achieve. But we are not there yet. Every headline or video of official abuse, injustice, and difference, killing or murder reminds us of how far we still have to go. Every story reminds us that Americans of color must endure a constant state of random vulnerability, even when they're just driving to work. The candidates addressed a mostly African-American crowd. Mark, let me start with you. We saw a former Maryland Governor Martin O'Malley there. He had to apologize to black voters at one point during this campaign when he said all lives matter. That is a hot button for many African-American voters. They say that if you can't say black lives matter, that you're not fully appreciating and supporting what African-Americans are going through. Which of the Democratic candidates right now do you feel has the momentum with black voters? Well, I mean, Hillary Clinton's way ahead with all voters, including black voters. But I think that phrase, Black Lives Matter, people need to understand what it means. I think maybe some non-black people don't get what it means. What it means is black lives matter, too. All too often when it comes to policing, it seems that only white people matter and black lives don't matter. And we find case after case of police officers stopping people for driving while black, taking them out of the car for driving while black, and basically putting them in jail for how, driving how while black. That? The idea is that black lives do matter. And and the implicit assumption is t to too many people, black lives don't. Really Jack, to jump in because you've got a candidate, uh, Ben Carson, who is a cult figure among many African Americans, a hero for what he's done, and yet the Republican Party is struggling to court black voters. Oh, we're struggling. I mean, it's really Hispanic voters. I th we've tried to court African American voters over the years. I think it'll be very difficult for the, for our party. I wish we could. We Even can't. with a candidate like Ben Carson? Oh, if, if he were the no nominee, I think it's a very remote chance he could ever be the nominee. I think the issue is we've got to go after Hispanics. But what's really sad is, does anybody remember the language of Martin Luther King? How about judge a man by the content of his character, not the color of his skin? But to, too to, often to law today, enforcement doesn't do that, yeah, Jack. But, but I want to get back to why not court black voters now? You've got Ben Carson as a candidate. You had J.C. Watts as a well, very visible African-American. You've had many because others. Because it's, it's hard. There's limited resources, and I think those resources should go toward Hispanics. When I was in high school, I worked to do that in Allegheny County back in Pittsburgh. We were talking before the show. It's very difficult to do I think the inroads have to be with Hispanics. I think that's happening because Hispanics are becoming wealthier. I think they'll follow the same demographic trajectory as Italians and Irish did a century ago, who were once Democrats. As Hispanics become wealthier, they will move into the Republican Party. They'll move right. Well, you set it up perfectly. Let's talk about Hispanic voters. The Republican who says he's going to come in first place with Hispanic voters is Donald Trump. So how about it, Jack? Does Donald Trump have the momentum with Hispanic voters? And let's face it, you laugh, Mark, but we well, he's insulting even, them. Becoming, we even saw I'll... Mexican immigrants. I've seen them interviewed saying, you know what? I like his honesty. See, one thing you have to understand is that, is that Hispanics in this country are not a monolith. The media has a terrible habit of staring. I don't mean you, but the media has a terrible habit of staring typing Hispanics. They're a very diverse community. There are Hispanics, a certain percentage of that, of the Hispanic population that's very tough on law enforcement that would probably associate themselves with much of oh, uh, what Trump on, has said Jack. on the border. Trump is showing surprising strength, not just with Hispanics, but with all Americans. Case in point, he, he's high in the polls in Iowa and New Hampshire, two states that even strategists like myself have written off. I, but, I, if Trump can get us back in the game in Iowa and New Hampshire, this could be a real race. I Mark, wanna... we've seen it from voters. Where do you disagree with what Jack's saying? Well, first of all, I want to know how much those Mexican-Americans that are pro-Donald Trump were paid to say that, because uh, <laughs> I, I, I know that he does pay people to support him. I want to know how many people do that. Look, Donald Trump appeals to, yes, a good sector of the Republican elect electorate, the bigots, the people that don't want diversity in America, the people that don't want immigrants, the people that don't like Latinos. Yeah, they're bigots. 
in your party, Jack, but they're not big in the nation. So, yeah, he might well do well in your party. Yeah, but this see, Mark, is not, not something the not nation supports. The, numbers. the problem is that the, the numbers don't bear out what you're saying. Three months ago, I might have agreed with you. The problem is Trump is now topping 25% in the polls. Of the go, Republican Donald, electorate. go. Win the hey, nomination. Uh, not, there's know, nothing I, I'd like to see more. Mark, I got to say, the polls are amazing. Usually, when a candidate's this controversial, their unfavorables also go up along with their favorables. His unfavorables are going down. His favorables are going up. So he's kind of defying the odds. But, Jack, you know Reince Priebus, the head of the Republican Party, asked Donald Trump to tone it down because you are courting Hispanic voters. Where do you see all of this playing out? Oh, What's I think Trump, Trump has about as much chance of listening to the RNC <laughs> as uh, the man in the street. Trump is going to hit the accelerator. I think what Trump has to do in this debate, and I think what he's got to do more than the debate in the next 60 days, he really has to show himself to be presidential. He's won the PR war. He's got the attention. He's 25 percent in North. Now he's got to come across like a Reagan or a Kennedy. He's huh. got to be dignified. Now he has to show that. Is that possible, really? Jack? Would, no, honestly, Jack, would you advise? him to be dignified when it seems like all of his momentum is from being uh, well, proudly outspoken and not always apologetic? You ask exactly the right question, and that is, where do you draw the line? At what point do you stop the train toward public exposure and higher PR and higher exposure and begin looking dignified? Dignified. I don't know where you draw that line. Maybe you draw it in August. Maybe you draw it in September. Maybe you draw it in October. I'd have to be on the inside of the Trump campaign doing it in order to know that. I would probably draw the line pretty quickly. Trump needs to show himself in a dignified way. Trump is a reality star. Trump's job is to be outrageous. He does a very good job of it. And people like to watch him be outrageous. He gets ratings. He gets support in the polls. But no one seriously thinks that Donald Trump has any chance of being president. And I would say that includes Mark. I, I, listen, I, I have covered Donald Trump for years as a business reporter. I was stunned by this. I thought he was hurting the business brand. I still think he's hurting the business brand, but you cannot argue that politically he is doing quite well. Here's he what is, I can argue. I can argue that out-of-touch billionaires who hate Mexicans represents good part of the Republican electorate, doesn't represent the American Mark, electorate. you may be surprised with Hispanic numbers on Trump because you like the media. Once again, it goes back to this point. You presuppose Hispanics are a monolith. Hispanics include everything from Cuba. Cubans to Mexicans to Argentines to Guatemalans. They're a broad and group. And most of them are not you're going to be Jack. very surprised. I'd I, like to see I, those I'm numbers. I'm just saying, I have seen even Mexican-American immigrants interviewed who say they still support Donald Trump. So he's got that base. But let's talk about the debates overall. Mark, just put yourself in uh, the shoes of a Republican consultant, if you would, ah. and give advice to the candidates. Suffice to say, Donald Trump is going to be the one that people are going to be watching. How do you try and position yourself to get any of the limelight when Trump is in the room? I would try a really clever put down of Donald Trump. It's hard to do how to be more outrageous than Donald Trump. But Donald Trump says so many outrageous things. Think of a really clever put down. We've seen those throughout in, in debates. We have the There You Go Again with Ronald Reagan and Jimmy Carter. We have the You're No Jack Kennedy in the Dan Quayle debate. Think of some really clever way. It's actually pretty easy to make fun of Donald Trump. Find a nice witty combat, uh, a comment to combat him. That'll be on the national news and your polls will go up. I think but, I would. But, but do you risk alienating the very people that you may need in the end, those people who are lining up behind Trump? I would give exactly the opposite advice, Rebecca. I think what I would do, first of all, what you're going to see is a battle for the second tier. Trump's so far ahead. Trump's number one. You're now going to see Rubio and Jeb Bush and Scott Walker shoot it out for number two. If I were Rubio or Scott Walker or Jeb Bush, if I were representing any of those three candidates and I'm not, what I would do is I would have them focus on each other. If I'm Rubio, I focus on Jeb Bush, Scott Walker. I want to take them out and then focus on Trump. If everybody focuses on Trump, if, like if Rubio focuses on Trump, all that does is pump up Trump. And that's I say you, pump him up. Okay, do you want to hear my do. advice? Sure. My advice is we just saw Jeb Bush. Look how thin he's looking. I think I covered him for years. He can be very persuasive. He has not been at his best in this campaign. My theory is he's given up too many carbs. I think Jeb Bush needs to eat some carbs before the debate <laughs> and go in there pumped up and ready because he has not been as articulate on the campaign. Uh, well, I don't think it's, it's, it's his message good a makes theory. a lot it's of sense. Good if someone, I, I remember someone once I asked if uh, music was their religion, and she said to me, it's as good a religion as any and a whole heck of a lot better than most. I would say that about your theory. <laughs> well, let's switch 
switch over to Democrats, and now we'll let Jack take uh, uh, the chance to play a Democrat if he were doing some advising. So, Jack, I am going to start with you. If you were advising Hillary Clinton this mm. week, how would you tell her to respond to the continuing questions about this email controversy, what she did and did not do while she was at the State Department? Oh, if I were advising Hillary, I would say <laughs> you're in a cycle right now. You're locked in a cycle where all of your coverage is going to be negative. What you want to do is get out of sight. I'd tell her to go to Martha's Vineyard and come back after Labor Day. Let the Republicans fight each other. Let, the, let Trump make noise. Let all the Republicans shoot it out. Let there be this bloody battle. you got to hide. All your coverage now is going to be negative. The last thing you want to be is on television talking about the emails because it's all negative. You can't win no matter what you say. Mark, get out of town. I have to say, I, I think he's got some good advice. She d can't win. We've been criticizing her for not talking to the media. This week, she did talk to the media, and in addressing the email controversy, she said, "Listen, I'm the candidate that's all about transparency. I want the State Department to rest, address my uh, release my emails. I'm not sure Hillary Clinton making the argument that she's the candidate all about transparency is the best argument I, for I her." Agree to ignore the email issue. It's a non-issue. It means absolutely nothing and no one cares about oh, it. Oh, oh, but listen, I do think I she should go out and talk about policy. I thought she did a really great speech on the right to rise, which is Jeb Bush's supposed slogan before the, the Urban Institute. I mean, they were, she was talking about the fact that he's against Medicare, he's against the Affordable Care Act, he's against providing people wait, health wait, wait, care I'm or gonna, the minimum wage. I'm going to drag you back in just like we're trying to get Hillary Clinton to talk about it on this email issue because I spoke to a friend of mine who is a tried and true Democrat. Uh, I would have assumed she was either going to be supporting Bernie Sanders or Hillary Clinton. She said she doesn't think Bernie Sanders could win, but she can't vote for Hillary Clinton. And she says it's because of the email issue. She says, I would fire someone on my staff for doing something like that, and I can't vote for someone well, that you, I would You know, fire. it's interesting that she can't vote for Jeb Bush either, because Jeb Bush didn't disclose his emails. And she can't like Colin Powell either, because even he was Secretary of State, he put his emails on it, privately. And market. you know what? Perception. I'm running you for delegate, and I have private out. emails as well. This is extremely common. It's a complete mountain. Out of a I'm going to let you in by clarifying whether you, as a candidate for delegate, have classified emails oh, on your server. I don't know. I admit I don't have any classified information, but Colin Powell does. Oh, and he, and he was the Secretary of State before Hillary Clinton. Listen, he there's going to be a lot to too. talk about next week after the uh, Republican debate. So, gentlemen, thanks for joining us this week. And uh, you, we'll see what Morris has to say when he's back next week. Thank, Thank you, you Rebecca and Jack. Thank you.